My name is Martin Andreller and I work in the Estonian Museum of Occupations and Recent History as a curator and as a researcher. Uh, my main task here in the museum is to help producing different exhibitions uh, concerning Estonian recent history, concerning the theme that the museum is about. And my research is based mostly on the armed resistance against the Soviet Union in Estonia uh, from the time period 1944 to, let's say, 1980, when the last uh, Estonian forest brother was found dead in, uh, in West Estonia. The museum is uh, founded as a, a private institution, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the founder of the museum, uh, Olga Gisler Rizzo, uh, was, uh, well, she left Estonia in 1944, just uh, before the Red Army uh, or the Soviet Union occupied Estonia again. Uh, around uh, 90,000 Estonians uh, just uh, went away as a war refugees uh, towards Europe or with boats and ships uh, towards Sweden over the Baltic Sea. Uh, Olga left as well as a nurse and uh, she ended up in the United States of America. And uh, in 1990s, when Estonia uh, got uh, away from the Soviet rule, we got our independence back, mm -hmm. uh, then Olga wanted to uh, give something back uh, to her uh, homeland. And uh, then the discussions were held, and as similar museums are in Latvia, in Lithuania, in other states in Eastern Europe, and Estonia didn't have uh, one at the time, then it was uh, decided that uh, she's going to build uh, that museum for Estonian people. The museum was opened in 2003, uh, and uh, it's still, and most likely, it's going to be the only museum that uh, just concerns only for that time period, 1940 to 1991, concerning all the subjects and themes uh, from the time era mm -hmm. and introducing the recent history uh, to the Estonians, of course, and also to our visitors from all over the world. In 2003, when the museum was opened and a permanent exhibition was made as well, and it covers uh, uh, 1940 to 1941, the first red year, so to speak, the first Soviet occupation, uh, 1941 to 1944, uh, the Nazi occupation, and then from 1944 to 1991, and the second Soviet occupation. It's, uh, the main exhibition is uh, built on the chronological basis, so we have all the year markings uh, in the display, and uh, under that uh, uh, specific year are the items from that year, documents, uh, handmade items from the Siberian prison camps or from the deported persons. And of course, uh, the exhibition itself is divided into uh, seven specific time eras or frames with uh, a documentary film. Also on our internet homepage, you can see them. And those films then are like the extra material with the interviews of the actual witnesses of the different events and so on. So, which helps to describe it everything. Mm -hmm. When the museum was opened, then of course people started to donate different documents and uh, materials to the museum as well. Uh, of course, most of the official <coughs> records, uh, like the Soviet State Security Forces uh, files, well, let's say KGB files, then it's much uh, simple, uh, they are preserved in the Estonian State Archive as most of the official documents. Uh, but of course, people have donated uh, their own papers that were given to them, for example, when they were released from the prison camps. And uh, those uh, have ended up in the museum collection in our archive. Uh, but most of the official materials, as I said, uh, are uh, preserved by the Estonian state in the state archives. Uh, in 1944, uh, in the end of the year, when uh, uh, the German armed forces retreated from Estonia and the Red Army, uh, so to speak, uh, liberated us again, as they tend to say, uh, but actually occupied Estonia for the second time. Uh, then Estonians hoped uh, that the Western countries, the Western democracy, uh, won't uh, forget us. That when the Second World War ends in uh, the world in general, as it has been ended in Estonia at the time, uh, then uh, uh, the Western democracy will help us. They will tell the Soviet Union that uh, you have to 
go out of the Baltic states and from the Eastern Europe, which is not your land. And people started to hide themselves. They already knew from the year 1941 that uh, most likely they will get arrested, those persons who were actively against the communism, against the Soviet Union regime, the totalitarian regime. Uh, they started to hide themselves, collect weapons. Their main aim was just to survive until the help from the West uh, arrives. Now, of course, in 1945, 1946, uh, they attacked uh, the local authorities, the communists, uh, the, let's say, militia stations and so on. Uh, in 1947, 48, uh, their operations weren't held in that, uh, let's say, big proportions. Uh, they started to realize that the help from the West isn't coming, so we just have to survive until, well, uh, in my opinion, they still had the hope that someday uh, the things were going to change. In 1949, in March, over 20, 22,000 Estonians uh, were deported to Siberia. Uh, most, mostly also the members of the uh, Estonian armed resistance, their families, their relatives, their friends. As the Forest Brothers had stated before that, that uh, they will do everything that they can uh, to prevent that kind of mass deportation to be held again. Of course, the Forest Brothers, Estonian resistance in Estonia, didn't have the Estonia-wide uh, network of our organization. Uh, we had several attempts of building that kind of network, but it was, uh, it failed, uh, the KGB, as it was later named. At the time, the name was different a bit. Uh, so it state security forces uh, did their job, let's say, quite uh, good in their uh, point of view. They managed to arrest over 8,000 Estonian Forest Brothers. Over 2,000 of them were uh, killed in different battles, uh, in different actions. And uh, around 5,000 or more then legalized in the end of 1950s. Uh, Josef Stalin, the dictator of the Soviet Union, died in 1953. A couple of years later, the regime itself got a bit softer and uh, it was actually said to the armed resistance members that uh, you can come out of the woods and we will not do you any harm. So some of them then uh, came out of the woods, uh, but Forest Brothers were still active or fighting in 1960s, in 1970s. The armed resistance uh, kind of kept alive uh, the memory of the Estonian independence, uh, kept alive the hope that someday uh, we will get our independence back or freedom back and uh, they were kind of the moral support uh, to the let's say civilians who were living their everyday life in the villages in the towns uh, that somebody is uh, going actively against uh, the terror regime somebody's fighting somebody's there when we need them then they will come to help us the Forest Brothers uh, divided different leaflets, they made even their own newspapers. Uh, they quoted different news from the Western uh, radio stations about uh, events in the world. And then, of course, the, let's say, political leaflets and banners about that uh, we can make it, we just have to survive a bit more and then it's possible to get our independence back. The stories of the armed resistance uh, were told to children I even remember one uh, story told by my grandfather. Uh, his good friend uh, was a forest brother. And uh, the story was that uh, Ado, as it was the forest brother's name, uh, was at his uh, home, in his home farm, eating lunch uh, for a brief moment. And as the farm is just in the middle of the fields, on one side is river, so it's just a plain field, you can't hide anywhere. And Ado, noticed from the kitchen window that uh, uh, the state security forces are actually coming. He didn't have anywhere to run, only the little uh, barn in the yard. He ran there, opened the hatchet, under the barn was a small hideout where he could see and observe what happens in the farmyard. He was there waiting, had nothing to do anymore, and uh, he noticed the uh, state security forces uh, walking into the yard uh, the officer went into the house and returned with uh, Otto's jacket, which he had forgotten there. Uh, they had a talk with them, 
uh, the dog sniffed the jacket and ran straight to the barn, crawled under the stair, and the other said that I had my pistol and I thought that when the dog attacks, I will shoot it and then I will shoot myself. I will not surrender to them. And then he said, it was very strange. The dog kind of started to cry, waved his tail and then crawled out of the barn and ran the other way and the Soviet state security forces ran uh, behind him. And I was saved. And I still figured that uh, the dog was just uh, pitying me, thinking that when you're living like a rat under the house, then why should I bother you? Although the, the fact is that the service dog was just poorly trained. But, well, who knows? It's just part of the legend, the legend of the resistance, the urge for the freedom and independence, which just continued through the years of the occupation. I think that's the biggest achievement we can uh, uh, say about the armed resistance nowadays. I was born in 1985, on the 23rd of December. Uh, so my memories, of course, from the Soviet time era are quite, uh, let's say, small. I remember one time in the kindergarten uh, when we were playing in the yard and then the Soviet uh, fighter planes flew over very low and it was very frightening. And uh, I remember in those days when the, let's say, singing revolution was taking place in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, in the kindergarten we actually saw uh, the mm, videos uh, from Vilnius where the tanks were driving around. And then uh, our teacher came into the room, saw it, and then just switched the TV off and said, there's nothing to see here for you. Uh, don't mind that. It was just a film. Although we understood that it's not a film, it's happening real at somewhere. But from the period when the power was actually changing um, during the re-independence, uh, I remember that uh, I think people were kind of scared at that moment still that uh, something might change, that uh, independence we got might be taken back. Or I remember just uh, the bit nervous time period when, when, for example, my parents were speaking about something uh, but I didn't hear quite well what they were telling. And when I asked and they said, that, oh, no, it's not of your business. But they remember that people were a bit like nervous. They were happy but they were still like kind of afraid of something. But I think it's just a heritage of the, of the totalitarian regime we were under. I think the history has been always used by the politicians and politics. Although in my personal opinion, history should be left as it was. It has to be introduced, explained, and people have to make their own opinion about the history. And uh, when uh, when politicians are going to use, the, let's say, our history or your history in some other ways than just to explain and describe that, to make uh, some of their programs or ideas to work, let's say, to use it in a bad way, then I think it's, uh, it's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. History is just uh, stories and things that happened uh, we can explain them, we can describe them, we can learn from them. But I think we shouldn't use them to change the world nowadays. It's in the past. But we have to keep that, of course, in mind what happened. There has been different uh, memorial events uh, in Europe, in Estonia as well, that are, let's say, supported by the EU Commission. Uh, in August I was in uh, Lithuania on the 23rd of August, uh, when the Day of Remembrance uh, was held. And there were different uh, young people from all over Europe, actually, uh, dedicating that day for the memory of uh, those who suffered under the totalitarian regimes in Europe. And uh, that program was, I think, very good, because when we speak of the European memory, then we actually have, I think we still have that west and east side of the memory. Just as the Iron Curtain once was, I think the, the sides of the memories are also divided. Uh, because uh, our history uh, from the recent past, 
from the 1940s, 50s, I think it's not very well known in the West Europe, in England, in Spain, for example. And, uh, of course, uh, in the Soviet time, in the time of totalitarian regimes, I think even the mm, history of the Western Europe wasn't told in the exact way in here as well. It was a bit changed, as the totalitarian regimes tend to do that. They change history for their own benefit. In Europe nowadays, we should uh, change the overviews of our history. We should, uh, uh, we should uh, share the history of the Eastern Europe to the West and vice versa as well, actually. Uh, in that case, uh, the history should be common, explained more, and uh, that kind of events, I think, help to make that. When we look at, uh, let's say, Nazism and Stalinism, or the Soviet regime in total, then, uh, then I think one of the, well, I don't know if the word problem is the best for that, uh, but one of the points are that uh, the West Europe, did suffer under the Nazis, but not under the Soviet regime. And Eastern Europe mostly suffered uh, from the Soviet regime. Because, uh, for example, in Estonia, 1940-1941, one year the Soviets, then three years of the Nazis, and ten decades of Soviet regime. Uh, it's, it's very hard to equalize different regimes. It's, it's, it's very hard because with different regimes, there are different numbers of persons who suffered, there are actual persons behind those sufferings. How can we equalize that? It's, it's, very, it's very hard and I think impossible and maybe even not needed to say uh, which was more like badder or, or worse. We just have to give the opportunity to people to see the terror made by the Nazis and also the terror made by the Soviets, by the Stalin regime and so on. Of course, uh, it's, a, it's a really tricky question because as the things happened in the recent past, it, it is very recent, the people still alive uh, who maybe even participated in those events, who were in the death camps, who were in the prison camps, who were in the jail. They have their own very strong personal, let's say, attachment to those events. In this museum, I have seen uh, lots of persons, uh, old men and women, who have come to the museum. Uh, it was, I think, two or three years ago. Uh, so the museum was opened already for six or seven years when an old lady came in and said that uh, I know you have been open for a while but I was too afraid to come here because I was afraid of what I might see and how it will affect me. I was in the prison camp in Siberia for 12 years. And then he was just really nervous, he was shaking uh, in the hall room. And uh, then she went to the tour, looked through the items uh, and she stood at the prison doors for a very long time. And then she came back to me and said that, well, it's nicely done. I was afraid of what I might see, and I saw the items, but I saw them in quite neutral way. So it's the past, and it has to be here. There are persons who have studied uh, the history, or, well, in schools in the Soviet time, who was born after, uh, let's say, Second World War, after the mass deportations, who don't have any connections with the terror that the totalitarian regimes did. They've just studied in the schools the Soviet textbooks of uh, how the Soviet uh, history was. So they have their own point of view based on that. They don't have the personal connection, so they just remember what they've studied in the school for years and uh, now they say that, uh, but in my opinion it's totally false. There was no occupation in Estonia, you wanted it.